So she's not calming down. Yeah. It's been a weird day. Mm. We found her and then she lost her doll. I used to have a doll like that, called Mina. Mina? Mina. Or Mini Mama, as my mother called her. You'll find it. Yeah. And that is a clip from The Lost Daughter. I'm delighted to say I've been joined by its writer and director. It's Maggie Gyllenhaal. Hello, Maggie. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank Look you. Look as though you're on a beach. I know. They actually set up this backdrop for my husband yeah. also in his office in Brooklyn. It, lo it looks fabulous. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us. Um, fascinating to talk about uh, The Lost Daughter. Um, I, found, I found this morning I was still thinking about the movie and I've just been talking to a couple of friends who've seen it and we all disagree about what's going on, which is fantastic. So <laughs> introduce us to the film, which, you, as I said, you've written and directed. Is take, it, take us into the world of The Lost Daughter. Well, I'm curious, though, what you all disagree about. <laughs> well, I know, but I don't think you want to put that in an interview because I think the less people know, but I think people need to go to this film and appreciate the shifting sands and ambiguity for themselves. I think that's what I'm saying. Sure. Um, well, it's, um, it's a film about a, a woman played by Olivia Colman who... Um, goes on a beach vacation in Greece alone and and ends up for a number of reasons, um, both, I guess, time alone with her own mind and also um, a connection she makes with a, another young woman, young mother on the beach. Um, she ends up going into her own past, some of the really dark, strange, unusual choices she made um, as a woman and as a mother when she was younger. Was writing and directing your own movie something you had been waiting for the right opportunity to do? Or was it specifically this story and uh, which had a particular genesis? What was it about this that made you wanted to, to get in charge here? No, I, I don't think it was... Um, it was this story that made me want to write and direct. Um, I think it was something that I that I had had wanted to do for a really long time and not even known it. You know, I think if in a way um, there was something always not totally satisfying to me about. Um, acting, as much as I love acting, I do, and I miss it. It's been a really long time since I've done it. Um, I think I was always bumping up against a wall. Um, I, I think, I think there are different kinds of actors. There are some brilliant actors who are more the kind, you know, that are like, oh, tell me where to stand and, and I'll do my thing. And then there are some that, um, that have their own story that they want to get told, their own reason for coming in and taking a job in someone else's film. And that's really always the kind of actress that I was and also the kind of actors that I wanted to work with in my film. Um, and I think I found, I don't know, there were some exceptions to this. There were some satisfying experiences, of course, where I felt like I really got to express what I wanted. But often I felt like maybe... 30% of what it was I wanted to say um, ended up in the film. And, and so then I guess I was looking for a story that, um, that, would, uh, uh, that would allow me, yeah, to express some of the things that have been on my mind. I mean, I guess mostly I, I, I guess I'm interested in telling the truth about... Um, about what how I how how I see um, the experience of being a woman in the world, being a mother, yes, which is a part of really a huge part of my life, but also a huge part of the movie, but also being a woman in the world as a thinker, as an artist, as a lover. You know, I I, I just I wanted to 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 tell the truth about it. You know, to put mm. the whole experience up on screen. 
just before we get to, to the stuff that we see on the screen, that it's a novella from Elena Ferranti. Can you just, we, the name will ring a bell with a lot of people. Can you just tell us about Elena Ferranti and what it was about the way, uh, about this novella that uh, that made you want to to film it? Uh, well, so Ferrante is, um, I mean, she's an Italian writer. She's she's anonymous. Ferrante is a, Elena Ferrante is a, is a pen name. Nobody knows who she is. I have interacted with her, but only through email. Um, really cherished emails. Um, and yeah, I mean, all of her work, um, in fact, the first the first books of hers that I read were the Neapolitan novels, which were, you know, huge bestsellers, flying off the shelves. Um, and I, I think when I read them, I felt like she was writing things down that um, I had never heard expressed before. Um, you know, I think we've made um, an agreement not to talk about aspects of our experience, um, I think particularly as women. And she broke the agreement. She just said all sorts of things that I was like, I didn't even know I thought that. I didn't even know I felt that. And here you are writing it down and it really resonates. And um, I thought, not just resonates, it was like electric. I dropped the book at one point because it was so, um, <laughs> it was wow. so both disturbing and comforting at the same time. Like I was reading the book and thinking, Jesus, this woman is such a disaster. And then within five seconds thought, well, uh-oh, actually, I really relate to her. I mean, it, it, in kind of every way. And so am I a disaster or in fact, is this a common experience that many, many people are, are feeling and that we're just not talking about? So I thought, well, what if instead of alone in my room having that experience, which was, like I said, both terrifying and electrifying, what if you could put it on screen and actually hear these things spoken out loud? And... Um, and what if, in fact, it was a communal experience? So you're sitting next to maybe your mother or your husband or your daughter um, while these very truthful things are, are expressed. I thought that could be, you know, a kind of dangerous and radical thing to try to do. And did she, is it right that she insisted that you directed? Well, I appealed to her for the rights. And um, I said I wanted to direct it, and I said why. Basically, I said, you know, some early version of what I just said to you, you yeah. know. And, um, and she said, yes, you can have the rights, but the contract is void unless you direct it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which I took as, you know, I think a, a really needed vote of confidence at the time. Yes. And did, and did she ask you to be in it? Did she want you to be in it? Did, no, did you know, she it? said to me, uh, well, she actually wrote this piece in The Guardian, which um, um, I don't know, maybe some of your listeners saw. She writes this, or she used to write a weekly or a biweekly piece in The Guardian, just a couple of paragraphs. And she wrote one to me where she said um, she knew that I was adapting her book into a film and that even though in some way she hoped that I would stay within the parameters of her book, that she, she felt that it was really important that the movie be good and that she knew that the only chance it had of being good was if it became mine and um, became also an expression yes through me. And she said if I were a man adapting her book that she wouldn't have offered me that freedom. But that because I was a woman and a woman artist, she didn't want to restrain me at all. And so really, she didn't. She didn't get involved at all. She didn't insist on anything. And I have a friend, you know, you saw my film, the woman who plays the hiker with the beautiful wild blonde hair who connects mm. with young Leda. Her husband is Severo Costanza, who directed and wrote My Brilliant Friend so brilliantly. And he, um, he says Ferrante, like every day there's three emails from her. He said they basically co-wrote it. He said, he, he said she was totally involved and he loves her. I mean, he doesn't know her, but, um, but that it was a totally different experience.
I wrote down a question, and then when I wrote it down, I thought that's ludicrous because the question just says, "Why did you want Olivia Coleman?" And of course, you wanted Olivia <laughs> Coleman because, because why wouldn't you want Olivia Coleman? But can you sort of target that and make it slightly yes. more precise as to what what are the gifts that she brings you? Yeah, well, I you know I thought at the time when I finished the script and I realized okay, the next move is to find my Leda. Um, I thought a few things. I thought. Um, I'll try to keep this as concise as possible. Look, I think there's a whole genre of film, um, really good movies, movies you and I, like we could name them on our hands like uh, so quickly, great movies made by great directors about crazy women. Um, it's almost like a, it's almost like porn, I think sometimes. People like to watch movies about crazy women, but my film is not about a crazy woman, or I guess you say mad here, it's not. It's about a sane yeah. woman who makes really aberrant, transgressive, unusual choices, and also who is in a lot of pain and has a lot of anxiety and, you know, confusion, as well as real sanity and intelligence, all at the same time. So um, I knew I needed an actress who was sane, um, who was profoundly sane, who had a strong mind, a reliable mind. So that's Olivia. Also, Leda, Look, I mean, we won't give anything away, but she she's tough and she's does some dark things, very dark. And um, and so I wanted to squeeze some lemon juice in that. You know, I wanted humor and I wanted someone who was um, inherently also warm. Um, and that's Olivia, of course. And uh, and I wanted someone who felt like a real living human being with blood in their veins. You know, I didn't want a fantasy version of a woman. I wanted a real one. And um, so all of that is Olivia. And I think is Olivia, I mean, well, she was just, I thought, well, why not just ask her? What's the worst that happens? The worst that <laughs> happens is she says no, and I'm disappointed. Like, I can manage that. So, um, so and also... I don't know, for me as an actress, of course you do one role and everyone sends you the same part over and over again or, you know, some people offer you things and you think, no, I don't want to play a divorced detective. <laughs> I don't know, that's just off the top of my head. Oh, you know, yeah. and then every once in a while somebody comes along and offers you something new and somehow cosmically not just new, but some, through the universe, you're like, how did you see me? You saw me. This is a perfect match. And I felt that about Olivia. I didn't know that she would feel that, but I thought this, is, this will offer her an opportunity, I, I don't know, that feels like a match and is new. To me, I thought that. I thought all I can do is hope that she might feel that. Just on, just on the, you talked about craziness and or madness, however you want to, to use that word and how it's very important that your lady played by Olivia Coleman, also Jesse Buckley, when we see the flashbacks, who plays Je who plays Olivia as a young So brilliantly, uh, Jesse Buckley, man. Yes. She's an incredible actress. But I, th I think this, I think this is your phrase. There is something, there is, I'm paraphrasing you though, that there is something about parenthood in which a lot of us dip our toe in madness. That's your is that there is something about being a parent which can make you crazy, maybe with a small c. Are we on that? Is that the kind of line that we're walking? Here? I don't think it makes you crazy. I think culturally we get told if you have dark, terrified, painful, confused feelings as a parent, like all of a sudden you're, you're abnormal. I think all of those feelings, as well as the the heart opening, you know, heart wrenching ecstasy that also comes with parenting, are all a part of a normal experience of being a parent. And um, so, I don't think it has to do with madness. I think children bring you to your knees. I think there is no way. I think the amazing thing about being a parent, I have a 15 year old and a nine year old. So I've been a parent kind of a long time. Um, I, I think you, you, you cannot avoid failure 
at least in some aspects, because you're, you've never done it before. There's no way to prepare yourself and to begin parenting as an expert. You begin parenting as a, as a total beginner. Even if you know how to change a diaper and you've babysat all your life or whatever, it is utterly different. And so that's an, an, an incredible opportunity for growing, like real hardcore growing. And of course, yes. that's always painful. There's a couple of lines which I wrote down as I was watching the film, which maybe is it's not giving anything away, but I think is maybe indicative of what you're just saying. These are both Olivia Coleman, I think. One is when she says, I'm an, un, I'm an unnatural mother. And she also says uh, that having children is a crushing responsibility. <laughs> and, and I wonder yeah. if there are two lines where, referring back to what you were saying earlier, that some parents, some mothers specifically will go, yes, I thought that. Well, listen, having children is a crushing responsibility. I mean, like, let's just be honest. Even if you, I, I love being a mother. Look, I'm off. I'm offered the opportunity, or I, I, I ask the world for the opportunity to have the space to make a film about something on my mind, and it's all about mothering. Like, it's a massive part of who I am. But like, let's just be honest. It's a crushing responsibility. The thing is, <laughs> that line in the movie, she says, she says, children are a crushing responsibility, and then she says to a to a very pregnant woman, and then she says. Happy birthday. I mean, it's it's also kind of funny. I mean, it's 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 um, it's not like an indictment of parenthood or children or something. It's just true. I mean, like even if you love it, even if a lot of the time you love it, it's massive. It's like, and then an unnatural mother. That's a straight Ferrante lift. You know, there's a lot of things in the script that are that have nothing to do with the book, but that line is Ferrante, right. and. Um, and I think it's so fascinating because what does that mean? What is an unnatural mother? What is a natural mother? I mean, it's it's like a, it's like, a, 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 it's, I don't, I'm not trying to say, I'll be very clear about this, that there's something wrong with that character and that she can't mother. I'm trying to say that the fantasy of um, either an unnatural mother or a natural mother is both are both flawed. One other aspect which I think I need to mention is uh, we mentioned Jessie Buckley who plays uh, later when she's younger. Mm. She forms a relationship with an extravagantly uh, handsome <laughs> professor played by Peter Sarsgaard, who is your husband. And they have scenes of intimacy uh, together. Were, you, were, you, were there any moments as you were directing that you regretted your casting decisions? Um, no, there were not. I... I um... I, first of all, I think my husband will be very pleased to hear you call him extravagantly handsome. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I, um, I really can't imagine another actor playing that role. Um, I have so much respect for him. Uh, and so much respect and trust for Jessie, who, you know, I mean, Olivia calls her Auntie Jessie when she's talking about her to my kids, you know. So, yeah, maybe I know it's unusual, I guess, but it was also in the service of something really important to all of us and really beautiful. And maybe it's like a little gift to my husband. I don't know. <laughs> unusual <laughs> one. But, but really the thing that I think is hot. Um, about those scenes that I think is important about those scenes that I think works about them is that um, it's not so much the physical intimacy, which, you know, my husband says that always that's the least real part of filmmaking. It's like shooting a pretend gun. You know, the, the, the thing that works is that they have a mind connection. Um, those characters have a mind connection, and of course the actors too. But what is, I realized, I was watching the film um, at the New York Film Festival next to Peter on this huge screen, and I realized um, the thing he is in the movie and that he needed to be in the movie in order for it to work is irresistible. You know, and for me anyway, you know, it's not so much somebody like thinking your body is hot or, I mean, that's resistible. 
What can be irresistible is somebody understanding your mind and finding it appealing. And that's what happens between those two. The movie is The Lost Daughter. Uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal writes and directs. Maggie, a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.